So welcome to all of you to our lecture number 23. We are continuing our discussion on the origins. And we started last time discussing about the accretionary origins. Um, very important for us here in uh, South America, where we have the Andean accretionary origin. And then we'll, uh, we'll, have, uh, we'll continue this discussion and we'll have uh, uh, then a discussion on the collision origins and then uh, one slide on the intracontinental so that you have an idea about all these aspects. You can imagine that the, all these aspects are so complex and um, we would need many courses to, to cover in detail all these aspects. But the basics, we are setting the foundation now for, uh, for you um, in this class. So uh, if you remember, we started discussing last time when I was showing something like this, uh, we were discussing about the various regions uh, in the anatomy, in the anatomy of, of such a, uh, an accretionary origin. And we discussed about the accretionary prism. If you remember, we had a, um, a discussion on the type of structures and I ended the class showing you the various uh, metamorphic uh, domains in, in the field of pressure and temperature, pressure uh, being equivalent to uh, depth as well. So, because um, uh, we discussed about the blue schist phases, and I was saying that this happens in, uh, in the accretionary prism, you have low temperature, but high pressure, and you, you get these uh, rocks um, that are called blue schists. All right, uh, let's move farther inland. So towards the um, <clears throat> towards the uh, plate, uh, which is above, not the subducting one. Uh, so let's look at this part that is called the four arc basin. And as you can see, the four arc basin, you have basically sediment, sediments that are being deposited there. So in the, in the end, you have flat lying uh, sedimentary layers. Um, and this is formed, as you can see, uh, on uh, part of the prism. Yeah, part of the prism. You might have some oceanic lithosphere that was trapped there, uh, depending where the subduction was initiated. Not necessarily where the continent uh, or whatever you have here. You might have an island arc, so you might have this uh, little chunk of uh, oceanic lithosphere. Um, and moving beyond this, uh, this. Um, for our basin, we encounter what's called the volcanic arc. Now, the volcanic arc uh, is uh, represented by a chain of volcanoes, a chain of volcanoes, and it, it is on the edge of the overriding plate. Um, and what happens here, uh, for instance, you know, we have these volcanoes uh, in South America coming from Chile to Colombia. Um, and the reason for the existence of these volcanoes is, as I was mentioning last time, is the fact that there is dehydration uh, of the subducting plate. So the fluids, as they ascend, uh, you will learn in the class with Marcos, when you study petrology, uh, you'll learn what processes lead to the formation of uh, of magma through partial melting of pre-existing rocks. The melting is always partial. You won't have kind of uh, uh, pools, oceans of magma there. No, it's partial melting. But uh, one of the um, uh, situations that lead to partial melting is uh, influx of fluids. So this influx of fluids in the conditions of pressure and temperature temperature in this mantle wedge here will generate, will lead to, to uh, partial melting, which generates ascending magmas. And they ascend, and basically this leads to uh, magmatism and eventually volcanism, so the, to the formation of this volcanic arc. And we have two situations. We have the situation where you, you have an island arc. Um, if you have two oceanic plates, so one subducts un under the other. Uh, so in this case, you, uh, an island arc is developed on the overriding plate. 
um, you might have a little chunk uh, of continental crust and there uh, maybe it was rifted prior or, or so. So this is a situation of the island arcs and this is what you see in the Pacific on the uh, east side yeah, of the Pacific. You have all these archipelagos. They are island arcs. But then we can, we can have the situation where we have a, a plate, the overriding plate has a continent like South America. And then we have a continental arc, yeah, a continental um, volcanic arc. And this is very typical for, and you are probably used you, uh, to the fact that uh, from Colombia down to Peru, Ecuador, Peru, and uh, Chile, we have this uh, chain of volcanoes. Now, here is something that, again, uh, the details, you will learn them with Marcos in terms of the types of rocks. But you might know already from the uh, general geology class uh, a bit about the rocks. And the idea is that if you have the volcanism that leads to the and magmatism and volcanism that leads to the formation of island arcs, the igneous rocks here are mostly mafic to intermediate. Whereas if you have continental crust, the ascent of magmas, these magmas that are produced here through the continental crust will change the chemistry of the magmas. Yeah, they will transform through various processes. And that's why the volcanism will lead to the formation of intermediate to uh, acid rocks, silicic rocks, so uh, rocks that have a lot of silica. And this is where you, you have this massive like uh, uh, as a manifestation of um, magmatism, you have the emplacement of large um, batholiths. So these are very large plutons of granite. So you will not find granites in the volcanic island arcs because gra the granites are silicic acid igneous rocks and they reflect a lot of differentiation of the uh, initial magma. And they are, uh, you, you get an evolved melt that reaches to the surface. That's the idea. So uh, you, you would expect rocks like basalt, yeah, like basalt, mafic, um, and andesite uh, in the island arcs, but in the continental arcs, you'd expect things coming from um, andesite towards rhyolite with the equivalence at depth or as granites, for instance. So remember the difference between magmatism and volcanism. Yeah? The magmatism is the uh, emplacement of melts of magma somewhere at depth and crystallization at depth. And we have um, the plutonic rocks as opposed to the volcanic rocks where the magma gets to the surface. So we, the magma that gets to the surface, we call it lava and you have volcanic rocks being formed. And you will learn in the classification of igneous rocks, you will learn that we can have different rocks tex texturally. So in the way they look like, because some have large crystals like the granite, and you can see them because they had time to crystallize slowly and the crystals to grow. And these are the plutonic rocks, but the same chemistry, if the magma gets to the surface, it solidifies rapidly the crystals do not have time to grow. You have to uh, look through a microscope at them, but they are the same. You have the same minerals and the same chemistry, but the rock looks different. It looks like a volcanic rock. The texture is different. Um, and uh, for this, uh, we would call these rocks aphanitic as opposed to phanaritic. Aphanitic, you cannot see the crystals, the individual crystals with the naked eye. So the equivalent of granite would be rhyolite. Yeah. So when you talk about rhyolite and granite, the same, the same material, yeah, and the same minerals, but the rock looks different. All right. So that's the idea. Just a bit of background in petrology, so that you, you, when Marcos asks you or tells you some things, you already know them. All right. So um, <clears throat> as I as I was uh, just mentioning, um, I was mentioning how this forms, yeah, where the magma comes from, from the, um, from the addition of fluids, yeah, of uh, volatiles like uh, water and carbon dioxide. 
um, that are released from the plate that subducts. All right, now, if we go beyond the volcanic arc, beyond, we have a region that we can call back arc. Anatomically speaking, it's be at the back of the arc, yeah? So we call it back arc. Now, what happens in, in the back arc depends on other things. So I say here in contractional back arc regions. So contractional means that you remember we discussed about this situation. You can have a um, slab rollback, yeah? But if this continent pushes, for instance, this, this keeps pushing, pushing and pushing, you don't have the situation of extension. So in, in these contractional back arc regions, there is shortening, yeah, because you, the stress basically leads to shortening. So you have the formation of a fold and thrust belt that can be thin skinned or thick skinned, yeah? So that's what would be a, a belt of basement um, cord uplifts, as you'd see in the textbook, would be a thick skinned fold and thrust belt. So basically the basement is involved. So you can see, as we discussed, they can be mixed. They can have, these fold and thrust belts can have parts that are thin skinned and parts where the basement is involved. Um, and we, we saw this in the case of, um, of the Andes. And this type of back arc region is, has this name, Andean type back arc, because nowadays this is such a famous region that if we look at an old origin, for instance, we look at an old origin and we, explore it and so on, and we can say, well, it has an Andean type back arc, yeah? So people would know what you refer to. All right, now, um, <laughs> the idea is that uh, I say here that if the subduction angles, yeah, they are moderate to steep, and you have the, uh, the um, uh, strata, uh, you know, um, on the other side of the, of the arc, you develop this fold and thrust, uh, belt and it's a thin skin, yeah. But if if you have shallow subduction angles, so the subduction plate kind of shears along the base of the overriding plate, the stress basically will transmit in such a way that basement penetrating folds would be reactivated, yeah. So it's very likely to get these thick skinned situations, yeah. So and even along the along the Andean margin, we have different sections with different angles of the subducting plate. Um, so, so the situations can be different. All right, so this is, I think, very clear. We discussed about fold and thrust belts. Um, this one that may seem new to you, uh, I mentioned it last time, it's this, this situation. You have the rollback, yeah? You have the rollback, and you remember uh, that the rollback velocity here is larger than this one. So, or, or this one is in the other direction. <laughs> um, so what happens in this case, you, we don't have a gap. Yeah, we, we don't have gaps to look uh, to, uh, to the bottom. <laughs> and uh, then this is an ongoing process. So the rollback is accompanied by extension uh, in this part, in this part of, of the overriding plate. Uh, and then this leads to the formation of what is called um, a back arc basin. Yeah? And uh, we have these situations. We have them in, in the um, Pacific on the east side. That's why they are called Mariana type back arcs. And when you, uh, we, we look at what happens today, but you as future uh, geologists and geoscientists, when you go on the continents, and most of you will be continental, geoscientists looking for resources. You have to unravel the history of what happened and the anatomy of the terrains that you are exploring. So the idea is that you have to recognize these features after they were deformed and the environment. So you can say, well, this was a back arc environment. For instance, in Canada, you have a very famous um, mining camp, which is called the Bathurst Mining Camp, with a type of deposits called volcanogenic massive sulfide deposits, and um, very important for the industry. They, they, they produce copper and uh, zinc and lead and some gold. And what happens, the environment was at some point a back arc basin. 
or the Becker Basin. Now, it's part of the Appalachian Mountains, or Appalachian origin. But as you know, the, we discussed the Appalachian origin was formed as, as a result of the closure of an ocean. Yeah, and this is what Tuzo Wilson, when he came with the Wilson angle, yeah, uh, the closure of the of an ocean, the Apetus Ocean, and you've got this uh, this uh, collisional origin. But so the former Becker from the time of the accretionary stage, the former Becker was severely deformed. Yeah, and now we look at uh, folds, and uh, the structural complexity is extreme, but we recognize the initial environment that favored the formation of these ore deposits that we are interested in. So that's the idea, that's the challenge. We learn these things, we learn what happens when they form, and then that's why we studied a bit of structure, geology, and I insisted on the formation and so on, because you will be like detectives. You will have to understand the history of what happened, yeah? So that's the idea. So you see things are connected. We don't, don't just learn them just you know, to to add more knowledge to uh, uh, to our uh, storage. All right. Now, uh, finally, to conclude this chapter on 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 the uh, accretion origins, metamorphic belts. I already told you about the blue schist phases that happens in the accretion reprise. But when I explain to you about the metamorphic phases, anticipating a bit what you will learn with Marcos. Um, and uh, the metamorphic conditions. So I was telling you, well, this is unusual. Yeah, it happens only in this accretion reprises. Normally, metamorphism, we call it regional metamorphism, or as you see it here, Barovian uh, metamorphism, has these stages from green schist to amphibolite to granulite, and it happens in the internal part at the depth, internal part of the origin. So, what happens, these accretion origins? have these two regional, yeah, parallel and paired metamorphic belts. Yeah, they are of similar age, but they are different in terms of the mineral assemblages because they formed under different conditions of pressure and temperature. And that's why, if you remember the graph last time, depending where you are, you have the transformations corresponding to that region, yeah, of uh, pressure and temperature and new mineral assemblages form. So from pre-existing minerals. So the, the idea is that in these accretion origins um, uh, have this characteristic feature of this uh, high pressure belt corresponding to the accretion reprise and then the belt of regional metamorphism. Yeah, you have a higher geothermal gradient and you get all these uh, uh, different mineral assemblages, depending on how intense the metamorphism was, all right? So this is something, again, for you to, to keep in mind and see how things are related. That's why I like this. Uh, I like to provide you with a vaster perspective, yeah, not only of structural geology, and that's why tectonics is such an integrative um, part of geoscience. All right, so this is it, uh, I would say, for now, uh, in terms of accretionary origins. Accretion origins, as we discussed, are just a stage in a larger evolution, as you know. We, that's why I discussed about the, um, <laughs> this Wilson cycle uh, or uh, supercontinent cycle. And at some point, the oceans disappear uh, and we, we get the continental masses colliding. And uh, that's basically the final stage in this evolution, yeah, the final stage. Uh, the collisional origin. So um, the idea is that you have to imagine at some point in a very distant future, what we have now here at the Andes will basically be transformed by a future collision with, uh, with uh, our continental mass. And what we see today in the Andes will be severely deformed, transformed, obliterated. Yeah, because of this collision. So that's why when we look at the collision origins here, things get even more <laughs> complicated because we have all this history behind. All right. So um, let's look 
slowly, but uh, let's imagine mentally and do uh, we will we'll, we'll look at what might happen here. Uh, some stages and these stages have some consequences. And of course, we end up with a certain architecture of a collision origin. But as we discussed, because of the of the bending of the of the uh, plate that goes that is subducted the oceanic lithosphere, we get the flexure. Yeah, so we get a bump. So at some point, as this continent, as you see, uh, A, as it approaches the subduction zone, the basically the flexure will affect the continental margin. Yeah. So basically, this passive margin, if you look, you have a continental shelf. What will happen? The passive margin will basically at some point rise above the sea level because of the of this flexure. Yeah. And once it's above the sea level, it undergoes the erosion. So you see how things start, a lot of process starts to act and change things from what they were initially. All right, so we can, we are approaching, yeah, we are approaching um, this. And when, when, you, when you have this bulging, yeah, this, this flexure, there is also extension, yeah, because there is stretching at that point. So this stretching will cause normal faulting, yeah, parallel to the edge. So you see, initially in the this is the initial passive margin uh, uh, faulted blocks. They are lifted, maybe eroded, whatever. There are new normal faults that are being formed here. All right. So this is kind of pre-collision to the initial interaction. Now let's look now at the termination of subduction because. Once the continental part of the plate gets to the subduction zone, it's not going to subduct. It is thick, it is buoyant, so it is not going to subduct. Just give me 10 seconds. I have to vanish from view because my battery is running low, so I have to go below the, <laughs> the desk. All right. Okay, now we can continue. The danger is gone. So um, the idea is you have to, <laughs> yes, Maria. Um, what, what happens here, as you can see, imagine that we have the, uh, the collision here. So, so basically the subduction zone is clogged, subduction stops, yeah? But now you have this regime, yeah? So because of this regime, you have here the old passive margin, you have sedimentary layers. Yeah, so all this sedimentary section they will basically suffer deformation and shortening. And this means thrusting. So you see the formation of the foreland fold and thrust belt here. Yeah, uh, foreland relative to the continent A. Now you remember, as it was in the case of the Andes, and you, you have here the fold and thrust belt on the other side, yeah, with the foreland. Uh, on the, on the part of the continent uh, B, yeah. So that's the idea. But here you can start seeing that we might get a symmetry. Yeah, we might get a fold and thrust belt on one side, a fold and thrust belt on the other side. All right. So that's why not all not all collision belts are symmetric because of various um, <laughs> how to put it various things that come into play. But ideally, yeah, uh, we look at the most complex situation. Uh, this would be. Okay, now uh, what happens? Don't uh, forget that the loading, the loading of the of the plate here by thrusting will depress a bit the plate. So what happens? You have the formation of a foreland basin here. Yeah, you have a a, a foreland basin. Okay, so these are places where people look for oil, for instance, yeah, in the foreign basins. So that's why, uh, of course, in the Janos, you might have uh, some oil. In North America, um, if you go to uh, Alberta, for instance, you go to Alberta, and that is the oil producing part, uh, very famous of uh, North America. It's a foreign basin, it's called the Western Canada sedimentary basin. All right, so let's move towards the internal part. Yeah, the internal part. And here 
where the two the two uh, continental masses got welded together. We call that place a suture, especially if we find if we find a slice, basically a, a slice of o oceanic lithosphere. So you might have a slice of oceanic lithosphere that is basically trapped, yeah, thrust uh, through this collision. And basically we, we can follow a section of oceanic lithosphere. And uh, there is a name for this, uh, this segments of oceanic lithosphere that made it on the continent and are preserved in the orogenic belts. They are called ophiolites. So you may have heard about ophiolites. Uh, so there are some famous ophiolites. So that's how we, we can go and look and, and, and learn what the structure of the oceanic lithosphere is from the mantle to the oceanic crust, because some of these segments are preserved in the oceanic uh, orogenic belt, belts. You have a famous one in uh, the country in the uh, um, Arabian Peninsula called Oman. There is a country yeah, between, uh, be, you have Saudi Arabia and Yemen, and on the uh, east side, there is this country, uh, politically very stable without problems, Oman, a very famous, it's called the Oman of Fiolite. Another one is in the Mediterranean, uh, where you have the island of Cyprus, so, uh, and, and if you go to the uh, island of Cyprus, uh, you have the Trodos of Fiolite. Again, very famous geologically, yeah? So these are places, and uh, there are many, many uh, places, but these are the most famous where you can find, like if you go to uh, in North America, you can find such a section in Newfoundland, yeah? Now, nowadays, Newfoundland is, is an island east of the Canadian uh, mainland. So that's the idea. So these things are called sutures. So basically the suture is where the two continental masses were welded together. And there you might find the trapped uh, segment of oceanic lithosphere. All right. Um, so internal part, yeah, or this is what's called hinterland, yeah. Here you have the largest thickness of the crust. So the crust thickens considerably. So what happens because it's thick at depth, you have basically uh, plastic deformation. Um, you have, you know, uh, myelonites folding, regional metamorphies. So all these stages of regional metamorphies uh, at depth. And this part usually it is exhumed for a reason of erosion. So the top part is eroded. So that the deep part at some point reaches closer or towards the surface. So we can see these rocks in the, uh, in the cores of orogenic belts because these orogenic belts are living organisms. They have a life. There are different stages of orogeny. Uh, and and uh, as long as they are active, they have this life and all these things happen. At some point, uh, there is no longer an orogeny. So this becomes part of a of stable crust it is an addition to a, a pre-existing continent, if you want. And uh, this is how the continental crust has been growing with time. And that's why I want you to learn a bit about Precambrian geology, because it is extremely interesting and very exciting. You might like it so much because uh, it, it, uh, it really has amazing, amazing things to show. So um, <clears throat> anyway, if, you, you now understand that uh, this is a very complex zone, the central part of the orogenic belts and especially collision orogenic belts. Now what happens, and this is very important, I was telling you that this is an evolving organism, an orogenic belt. It has a life, like the accretionary belts, they have a life at some point, they die because something happens and they get obliterated or, or only uh, the remnants through collision. Now the collisional orogenic belts, they live for a while, but while they live, they mature, yeah, like human beings. They grow older and older and thing, transformations happen. So what happens is the next stage is the stage of orogenic collapse. And this might seem very strange to you, but this does happen because here we have extension. In Hello, the, teacher, the, may I ask yes. you a question? 
Yes. Thank you. Is it possible to find an affiliate um, formation in the in transformant margin? In a transformer, uh, well, theoretically, if we were to to uh, think about only uh, strike slip deformation, if there were no, no other component, theoretically, you wouldn't have. But normally, as we as we learned, you have different components. You don't have pure um, strike slip movement. So theoretically, depending on how the approach was. If you have a component actually of convergence, I think it, it could be possible. So uh, this, uh, again, uh, we discussed the end members, Gabriel, of, you know, very clean situations, you know, strike slip, perpendicular convergence, you know, things like this. Now, when you combine them, obviously you get, that's why we have all these variations in. Um, so I'm trying to think about uh, a region where you might have an, uh, like, uh, you know, some of your lytic, uh, uh, sequences associated with a pure, uh, or dominantly strikes sleep. I don't, I don't have one in mind right now, but, uh, might be. Yeah. I, I don't know what else to say. Do you have any, anything else to, uh, to say, uh, Gabriel or, uh, is that okay for the question? <laughs> okay. So I will um, I will continue. In general, the ophiolites basically will uh, reflect this trapping. So if you have the mechanical conditions that could have trapped a piece of the oceanic lithosphere, yes. So you you might find them, but you might must have orogenic uh like bells yeah for this to happen so what happens when the crust becomes too thick yeah uh it becomes warm at depth now you might wonder why does it become warm at depth because this is another thing you may not have learned yet and this is the fact that the internal heat comes from the decay of radioactive isotopes and uh, this heat that is generated in the thick sections of the crust, yeah, this is not easily dissipated. So it accumulates. So because of the warming of the crust at deeper levels, the, the crust becomes plastic. So it starts flowing, yeah? So it, it basically, it collapses under its own weight. As I mentioned to you in a previous lecture, uh, there is a, a famous, researcher in uh, uh, in this process or of this process of orogen collapse and uh, he said that this is like the you know like a brie cheese or camembert cheese you leave it in the sun so it, it melts in the middle so and it collapses under its own weight a bit like this yeah so what happens due to this you might have the development of features like, as you can see, because of what's called lateral spreading, you see the thrusts, yeah? And the regime is extensional because of this collapse. But in this extensional regime, <laughs> actually, um, is within the context of a compression regime, you see, yeah, of a compression regime. Uh, so basically, um, the process of extensional collapse occurs at the same time We've short while well, shorting and thrusting at the margins of the collision belt uh, continue. All right, now think about this. Because we have erosion and because we have extensional collapse of origins, we have a limit to the uh, elevation of, uh, of the mountain ranges. So because of these two processes, there is a limit so there and that limit is represented by the highest peaks in the himalayas today yeah a bit more than eight thousand meters um actually the uh the tallest edifice on earth is uh the island of hawaii yeah because from the bottom of the uh oceanic floor to uh 
what it is above the sea level, you have nine kilometers. But that, as we discussed, that's a volcanic edifice being built above a hotspot. But in, it's not an orogenic belt. But in the case of the orogenic belt, we have this limit. So we will not get uh, more than what we have today because of these two factors. All right, so uh, a very famous region that undergoes extensional collapse is the Tibetan plateau. Yeah, it's a, a high plateau and the same like the uh, Altiplano in, in the Andes. These are regions that basically become so thick and they suffer some collapse. Now, there is another stage in, in, in the life of this uh, collision origins, and this stage is called the delamination of the lithospheric keel. Now, lithospheric keel is this kind of thick part. Yeah, you see the thick part uh, of the lithospheric mantle uh, under the orogenic belt. And people have been looking at processes that they could not understand, like why in, in places where you have very thick crust and very thick lithosphere, and uh, you have a orogenic collapse going on, so you have a plateau, but at the same time you see some uplift. <laughs> so uh, people were trying to figure out what is happening mechanically at this scale. And uh, the idea was that um, there is this process of what's called delamination. That means that part of this uh, cold and heavy lithospheric uh, keel might delaminate, that means might sink, might break apart and sink. Uh, and uh, imagine you have a weight, yeah? Let's say you have a little boat and you put a, a very heavy weight and the boat kind of goes a bit down and you cut then <laughs> the cable and the boat lifts up a bit. And it's the same with the plateau uplift yeah, that people observe. Um, now, obviously, there are many other phenomena. And this, there is an important one here. Um, you have rising asthenosphere here. Because it rises, it suffers a, a, a decompression. And this is another process that leads to partial melting. Again, a bit of petrology here. And because of this, you have melts, uh, yeah, magma that penetrates the lithosphere and uh, the crust and leads to magmatism. And you will learn and you will find in many publications, you will find this term post orogenic or anorogenic plutons. That means that these plutons are not related to the process of orogeny, are not related to, to uh, as we discussed in the case of accretionary origins, yeah, the magmatism and so on. It's post orogeny, it's this final stage that led to the emplacement of these magmas and the, the formation of these plutons. So, post orogenic uh, plutons are found in all mature belts, orogenic belts. All right, so to summarize here, uh, we have, uh, I found uh, in, a, in a publication of an author called Park, he's a structural geologist, and um, uh, he has this uh, image, this sketch, which I think summarizes a bit, as you can see, one, two, three, four, five different sections of an ideal collisional orogenic belt, symmetrical one, yeah? So you, 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 he starts talking about the foreland here, yeah? And uh, the foreland uh, fold and thrust belt. And then we get into the central crystalline core complex. And of course, you might have, this is the suture, yeah? With the ophiolite. And here, so you are used now to the thrusting, to the thrusting uh, in the foreland fold and thrust belt. And you know that most of the uh, uh, rocks there are sedimentary, and you might have some uh, crystalline basement involved. But here in the in the central part of the origin, which, which he calls central crystalline core complex. Now it's not the metamorphic core complex that we discussed in the context of extension. 
but central crystalline core complex, it refers to the core of the orogen. Yeah, it's a totally different scale, what we are looking at here. Um, and here, basically, you can have what's called crystalline naps. Yeah, so uh, as, you, as you can see, crystalline naps are thrust sheets, but they are thrust sheets, so they are folds, yeah, low angle folds uh, that bring one on top of the other packages of basically metamorphic rocks. And uh, igneous rocks. And again, you have a lot of ductile folds, shear zones, uh, a lot of complexity, structurally speaking here. And also he shows post-tectonic, that means a post-orogenic pluton as well. Yeah. So as you can see, and then as you go on the other side, you go uh, through uh, fold and thrust belts and uh, four dips and so on. Four land basins, that's what a, a four dip is. All right, so you can read this text, but I think it's a nice summary of what we discussed. Now, um, I want to talk to you a bit about the Himalayas, because although we are in South America and we have the Andes here and so on, we have to uh, actually uh, talk a bit about a totally different part of the world, the Himalayas, because they are now nowadays in the present geologic time, as I said, we have two major belts. One is accretionary, the one that goes through the Americas, and the other one is collisional, and it extends from Europe with the Alps to Indochina, yeah? And a segment of it, part of it, is represented by the Himalayas. Yeah? And this one, as you see, as you know, it's more or less uh, west-east or east-west, as opposed to the Cordillera in, in the Americas, uh, which is north-south. So quite interesting. Now, as you know, definitely you learned about this or you heard in the general geology and in the context of um, plate tectonics, the idea of the Himalayas is that this is a result of the collision of this, what's called the Indian subcontinent with the Eurasian plate. Indian subcontinent having uh, traveled as a piece that was rifted from an, a, a large continent called Gondwana. Um, so Gondwana basically would be, if we, if we talk about the Pangaea, what uh, Alfred Wegener was thinking about this supercontinent, broke in two parts, the southern part Gondwana, which included what's today South America, Antarctica, um, Africa, and, uh, uh, and um, India and uh, Laurasia, which means Laurentia and Asia. Yeah? So uh, the idea is that the Indian piece, the Indian subcontinent, traveled, yeah, and eventually, as you can see through this evolution in time, from um, 140 in the Mesozoic, 140 million years ago, what you can see here, you see that before the collision, of Eurasia with India, there were several other small continental pieces. So this would be like accretionary tectonics, as you can see. And these small pieces, yeah, that first uh, prior to the Himalayan orogeny collided, this basically in the suture zones of these earlier uh, accretions, yeah, uh, are found in the Tibetan plateau. So the Tibetan plateau has the, the record of this prior small collisions, and then to the south of the Tibetan plateau, we have the Himalayas. So you see at 100 million years, the Indian sub subcontinent was not yet there, but you had this, basically this island arc, which today is preserved in the western part of the Himalayas, the coast and Ladakh arc. All right, so what happened is that, as you can see, 40 million years ago, this is when basically the end of the subduction, the initiation of uh, collision, yeah? So um, the what, what we call Trans-Himalaya, geographically speaking, is basically the part that is pre-collision, yeah? Uh, that's why it's Trans-Himalaya. Um, and the Himalayas 
basically, as you can see, the Himalayas basically reflect this deformation entirely to the south of the suture zone. So uh, you might be a bit confused now because I was showing you a very nice sketch of a, a symmetric collisional belt. And here I am, and I give you as an example, an asymmetric collisional belt, which is the Himalayas. But as I said, Himalayas is such a, such a, um, an important feature today that we have to talk about it. Now, our belts in the past, they do have collisional belts. They do preserve a symmetry. Yeah, but, but you can see that in the case of Himalayas, we have certain conditions, certain pre-existing conditions here, the formation of the Tibetan plateau. So that's why in geology, you never get bored because it's always something different. Uh, <laughs> all right, so now you can see that the Himalayas basically, and you see these main thrusts. So when you, when you look at the map, I'll show it in a bit of the Himalayas geological map, you have all these thr main thrusts, yeah? And the topography reflects this shortening and this thr thrusting. So basically these peaks that so many people want to go and, uh, and uh, take a picture or selfie on, the, on Mount Everest, basically, if we look at it geologically, as you can see, it's the result, yeah? The, this uh, amazing uh, elevation is the result of uh, shortening and thrusting. All right, so it's a stacked package. Uh, this is a, the map, the geologic map. So let's look a bit at it. You can see here, you can see in blue, something that's called the Indus suture zone. So this is a zone of suture. So the Himalayas basically are the, are, are the, the things that you see here to the south of the Indus suture zone. And you see, uh, uh, divided in, in several zones, like Tetian zone, Greater Himalayan, Lesser Himalaya. And they are separated by these thrusts, by these thrusts. And as you can see in red is something that is called the Trans-Himalayan Batholith. So you see this Trans-Himalayan Batholith and the Kohistan Ladakh arc that was accreted basically uh, to the north, yeah? Uh, only in the West. So basically, if now you if you look at this, you have a, I, I'm pretty sure that now you have a, a more clear picture of the Himalayas. You see here uh, also you you see this uh, image of the topography, and you see how nice we can see the Himalayan chain, and behind it the Tibetan plateau. Now, so. And the zone here is, of course, very complex. And I've shown you uh, the indenter tectonic e experiment as you have a block that indents. And all uh, in the context of strike slip faults, I was showing you uh, strike slip faults here and what's called escape tectonics, because to the east, there was room for, uh, for these blocks to move. Yeah, so uh, very interesting what we are looking at, I would say. Anyway. Uh, if we were to look from the satellite at the same thing, you see here the Tibetan plateau and you see the Indus suture zone and all these uh, things that were in colors like uh, uh, green and uh, other colors like the uh, Tetian Himalaya, Upper Himalaya and Lesser Himalaya. So basically you see where the topography is. Yeah, These are the peaks the, uh, as a result of shortening and thrusting. So these are sedimentary rocks and basically very young, actually this movement, it's a young, young uh, feature, geologically speaking. Uh, and this is where people rush to go and climb. Yeah, so <laughs> very interesting. Anyway, if you were to be on the Tibetan plateau, you would see something like this. Yeah, it's a flat depression. It's like an altiplano, a very high altitude, yeah, more than 5,000 meters. Um, and to the south, these are the Himalayas. And uh, in fact, the dramatic relief that you see, all these things that you see in terms of, of uh, geomorphologic features, they are the result of the intense precipitation due to the monsoons. Yeah? So due to the monsoons, you get this intense 
precipitation erosion. And of course, uh, you have glaciers as well, uh, Alp alpine glaciers that geomorphologically sculpt uh, the features here. And behind here, you see the Tibetan plateau. All right, so, so that's the idea of the Himalayas. So I, I, I think that now you have a, a bit of an idea of this, uh, of this belt. All right, one more thing uh, in this slide, I want to make you aware of what's, what we call intracontinental origins. So basically we are looking at zones of crustal thickening, yeah, shortening and crustal thickening at inside the plates, so not at the margins. So basically the formation happens inside these rigid lithospheric plates. So we have what's called far field propagation of compressive stresses. Far field propagation means the stress comes from far away. It's transmitted. Now, you might ask me, so why it, at some point we have this happening? So obviously you have the localization of the formation in zones, pre-existing zones of mechanical weakness. So you can imagine that the, the plate is not completely homogeneous, yeah? So you have a, a history, yeah? So in this long history of the formation of the continental mass, you have zones that are weaker mechanically than ours. So the far field stresses, they transmit, and in the, in the zones of weakness, the rocks yield, and then you have the formation, and for the formation of these ranges, these origin belts. Very famous ones are, as, we, as you can see, we are still, we are still, here you see Tibet, so the Himalayas are to the south. So the stresses here, you, these are very exotic names you may have heard in Central Asia, Tian Shan, Altai. Tian Shan and Altai are exactly very good examples of intracontinental origins, which are related to the formation in pre-existing zones of weakness due to the stresses propagated at the margin where we have this collision, yeah, and the formation of the Himalayas. And further uh, inside, yeah, inland, if you want, we have the, the development of these orogenic, um, orogenic belts. Now, uh, you can see here in this cross section, yeah, you can see here the Indian subcontinent, you see where the collision happened, and then you have the Tian Shan and the Altai farther inland. Now, this has been happening in the past as well. We had orogeny during all Earth's history. And of course, there are also old inactive nowadays intracontinental origins, some famous ones are in Australia. One is called Peterman origin. The other one is Alice Springs origin. So inside Australia, where it seems that, wow, there's nothing geologically, there is a lot <laughs> actually. And you see the different ages, Neoproterozoic and Paleozoic. So this being said, I think in a very short period of time, in a nutshell, I, I've introduced you to this very, very uh, interesting and complex field of tectonics. So um, please read these sections in, the, in this book, not from the other book, in this book, to consolidate some of these um, terms that we discussed. So this is it for today. Uh, if you have questions, as you know, as always, more than welcome. If not, uh, have a good weekend. Take care of yourself in, in all aspects of your life. Uh, take care outside not to expose yourselves to danger and also psychologically try to to reach out to whoever you think might be able to help you like friends to us as professors here yeah so please don't be shy all right so thank you very much i'll see you on tuesday and uh, we'll start a very exciting topic precambrian tectonics all right so thank you very much you're welcome, Juan. Thank you, teacher. Thank you, brother. Have a good day. Yeah. Oh, have a good day, all of you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, thank teacher. You, David. Thank you, Valentina. You're welcome.